Goeiedag. Alternatieve geneeskunde. Ja, dat omvat natuurlijk een heleboel zaken. Van uh, acupunctuur tot uh, massage, tot ademhalingstechnieken, tot uh, bloesemremedies. Nou, je kunt het zo gek niet bedenken. Er valt onder dat hoofdje alternatieve geneeskunde een heleboel. Alternatieve geneeskunde dan als in tegenstelling tot de allopathische geneeskunde, dat is wat u gewoon bij de dokter kunt halen. Gewoon de pillen en de behandelingen. En nu willen we zeker niet zeggen dat we op kleurnet vinden dat die gewone geneeskunde geen waarde heeft. Want als je je been gebroken hebt, dan kun je toch maar beter naar het ziekenhuis of naar de dokter gaan. Maar we besteden veel aandacht aan die andere alternatieve wijze van geneeskunde. Vandaag hebben we in de studio Ken Carlson en hij komt van Kauai. Dat is een van de eilanden in de buurt van Hawaii. En hij houdt zich bezig met de, de specifieke, eigenlijk de Hawaïaanse geneeskunde. En dan heeft hij daar zelf uh, wat mee gedaan. Onder andere bloesemremedies, dus bloemenremedies heeft hij uh, gemaakt. Die lijken een beetje op wat u misschien kent onder de naam Bach-remedies. Maar we gaan praten over de healing energies, de flower essences. En over wat hij uh, daar doet, de, het geloof de religie van dat eiland. En, uh, nou, het gesprek gaat in het Engels. Want uh, Ken, you are from Hawaii. So you, I, don't understand, I don't expect you speak Dutch. Very poorly. <laughs> Very poorly. Do you speak a little Hawaiian? Uh, a few words that are essential to what I do. Yeah. I, I always think that speaking in, in Hawaii is like, it's like singing. Uh, the names are, even if you... Are they for a short time? All the, the names of the streets and the hotels are very, yeah, makes you move. Very romantic, nice, smooth, beautiful, but lots of breath and mana in, in the names. What does mana mean? Mana is a, the Hawaiian word for a kind of energy, that everybody has that energy, but some people generate that energy more than others. Would you compare it to chi energy? Yes, I would compare it to that. Okay, so um, now... We don't know much about the Hawaiian um, system of religion and healing. Is it is it totally different from what we know in the West as normal medicine? Yes, but there isn't a system. There, you know, basically the average Hawaiian is overly fed, uh, undereducated, and uh, of of minimal religious persuasion. But yet there are many per, many prevailing religious structures which still exist today. Uh, the one I'm participating in is called Huna. But so that's only one of the Hawaiian religions? Only one, yeah. because Hawaii, as, as everywhere, has been conquered, has been has evolved. At once it was an ancient matriarchal system, then it was conquered by the Tahitians and became a patriarchal system like the rest of the world. War is best. And, uh, and with that, the whole system changed. And many of the Hawaiians today still work within religious structures that are part of the Tahitian system. But there is a earlier system that in this Huna system that I mentioned is, is stems from an earlier time. It stems from a matriarchal system. Now, matriarchy is a system where the woman has more of a, of a dominant place, yes. is more honored. Uh, I think there is still even... Uh, little islands, Bougainville, uh, I think, somewhere in the uh, South Pacific, where the women, uh, they are in power, and the inheritance laws favor the women, and that makes the whole system kind of stable, because then the women, they get the the, the farms and the, the property, and that's the way it works. A very strong women there, but is that still noticeable, this matriarchal history in, in day-to-day No, I don't think it is still noticeable. Uh, some, there were women who were, were part of a system called the Ali'i, which is basically they had the mana. They had more power than the average person. But that, they were born into it. It didn't come because they were women. Okay. Uh, yeah, one of the things I know about Hawaii, and uh, me having been there, lots of people swim and they do uh, surfing. But this, these are mostly guys. <laughs> Not necessarily. There are, Not necessarily. There are many, many women out there as well. Oh, well, yeah. uh, what we see here on television is it's mostly men, very daring and uh, yeah. big waves. But, uh, so. but if the women want to be with the men, they learn how to surf and get out there with them. Okay. Do you think tourism has spoiled uh, Hawaii? Yes. Yeah. It's almost destroyed it. 
Kauai, the island I'm on, is is uh, relatively well preserved. Yeah. Uh, still, it's it's losing ground, but ver- there's a, a, a strong majority of us who don't uh, allow it to get much further away. Yeah. I've been on Kauai, and what I remember is I uh, we came in with a plane and, and we had a helicopter ride because the island is inaccessible from most sites. You That's can right. you can land by there. There is a harbor, but most of the sites of the harbor are really well they're green that's my what i remember very very right. green and very high cliffs and and lots of uh misty cloudy situation there i think yes. it's one of the wettest areas in the world yeah that the height the highest part of Kauai is the is along with someplace else in asia is the wettest part of the earth yeah so because we have lots of rain but yet by the coast we have very little rain so in the top of the mountain it's maybe 600 inches a year by the ocean, maybe 20, uh, 20 inches per year. What I was also saw there was that uh, there was there were plantations or the, the remains of plantations on the island. Yes, sugar plantations. Sugar plantations. Yes. yes. Yeah. And mm-hmm. when I w- was there, I noticed that there was quite a bit of uh, marijuana uh, being sold on the beaches. Really, you noticed that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How could you not, or what? <laughs> well, it isn't as public as it is here. Uh, well, maybe because I was Dutch, people were approaching me. And That's said probably was true. <laughs> okay. Um, it seemed that alco- for the native people that were there, alcohol and marijuana were the main problems. Well, if it's a problem, it, it's prevalent. I don't, I don't really think it's a, it's a big problem. I, I don't think it's a problem as, as it was for the American Indians, for instance, with alcohol. Um, but it's, it's, it creates a certain lethargy in, in the lifestyle. Yeah. Um, uh, what I find interesting is that you work with flowers and, yes. and native uh, Hawaiian and Kauai uh, uh, flowers. Uh, while what I noticed was this uh, sugar and uh, marijuana. Uh, what is your interest in, in the flower vegetation, in, in, in the powers of the flower? Hey, that's, that's right. The powers of the flowers of, uh, of Hawaii and Kauai. Power flower. Flower power. <laughs> yeah. uh, the flowers in Kauai are some of the energetically most potent anywhere on the planet. Kauai is also called the Garden Island, and from being there, you saw it was green. Uh, m- many of the flowers stay in bloom 12 months a year, all year, all year round. Uh, it's, not an, it's not an atmosphere where the, f- where the plants and the flowers have to go into seasonal shutdown or wait for rain and come out in the rain as in the desert and other places. They're there hanging out all year long, just sort of being themselves, hanging out, being beautiful. And in, in what I do, which is make flower essences out of them, um, I'm provided the base stock uh, of what I think is probably the most powerful flowers in, uh, on earth to, to make now, essences. When you say you make flower essences, that's different from making perfumes. Yes, it's different. Yes? Uh, with a fir- perfume, you, you you use the actual material. You only, how would you you you, you extract the mana? Is that a that, good? That's a good way to put it. Yeah, but there's no smell. There's nothing like perfume, and it's taken internally, yeah. and they're taken to heal certain conditions. Okay. People, most people know about the Bach flower remedies. Yes. He, he lived in England, and he, he figured out that a way to get it from from the flowers and he made a whole array of different mixtures and essences that he said well for this ailment or this problem you take that kind of flower remedy which you take with a little thing on your you take a few drops basically from water that has been in contact with the flowers that's correct and my little man here decided to uh, ah, to fall now, it seems strange because you, you don't actually take anything from the flower, just like what we could describe as the energy. How comes that it works? Well, I could, I can, the easiest way to answer that is to ask another question. How come homeopathic medicine works? Homeopathic medicine is something that's popular all over the world, and it's, and it's pretty much accepted uh, even by the allopathic world that it, that it works. Um, there's well, I, I can name you a few doctors to who say who does. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. And they, and their basic story is that homeopathic uh, medicine is based on the fact that you take uh, a certain 
substance, a certain, uh, usually something that makes you sick in That's the correct. first place, uh, and then you you um, dilute it in That's a specific right. quantity, and you might dilute it to a one thousandth or a one ten thousand or even a one millionth part, and then I'm a physicist. I would say then there is really nothing left in there and there's no there is no noticeable molecules of the original substance there that's right and then it still seems to work that's right yeah. and in fact the more you dilute it the more powerful yeah. uh, the remedy is yeah not not so for flower essences uh, flower essences are n not nearly as diluted as as homeopathic medicine uh, but so much depends on um, the method in making flower essences, who's making it, the conditions, the flowers, where you're at, every place flowers are made, flower essences are made, uh, you get slightly different product from it, and a lot of it, uh, really, you have to find out by trial and error uh, wh what you have. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Now, one argument that could be used against homeopathic and, 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 and other of these uh, remedies is that uh, it's it's a complex way of self delusion of self hypnosis because uh, you buy this and it's made in a very complex way and you start to believe that it works and mm -hmm. because you believe it works it works mm -hmm. and that's true and that's true too yes it is <laughs> yeah so that's part of it it's part of everything if you were a doctor here and you had that stethoscope around your neck and a white collar I would have People a would believe me yeah. I would have a greater <laughs> chance of feeling that I'm going to be healed because you're there in that yeah, way yeah. so the uh, the Huna system that I mentioned earlier the first principle is in it is the world is what you think it is and uh, basically that's uh, uh, another yeah. way of saying that uh, yeah. if you think it works it works there is a lot of self-suggestion or self uh, it knows it, whatever you knew. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had someone here who did oponopono, yes. yes, which is a way of self-forgiveness, yes, uh, a radical way of of taking bad memories or bad deeds out of your memory, out of your out of your brain, so to say. Okay, this is yes. finished. Yeah, and to me, that looked like a self-hypnotic way to, well, you could say, a psychological way to get rid of your problems, of your of your past. Yes, um, is 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 that say invisible belief important for the, in, in the Huna religion? Yes, it's very important and it's, and, and it's very important to me in the work that I do with flower essences and, and in this Huna perspective because as far as I'm concerned the, the main, we, we came in with very few problems except maybe ancestral lines and DNA and, and that but I really, it's my experience that when we're born we come in rather pure, rather divine creatures and whatever happens in that birth process and whatever happens shortly thereafter and then whatever happens for the rest of our lives all have, have play such a significant factor in reducing the quality and the consciousness of who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have that same quality and consciousness but we, we've hidden it under a story which is our past which is our personality, mm -hmm. which is the, who, which, who which we think we are. Which is the traumatic experience you went through. That's but right. isn't it's true that, that we choose our own traumatic experiences. Is it? That's a good question. And I, well, I, if we choose our lives and... and well, that's a, that's a perspective, some have, that we come in and choose, choose our life. And I, thereby I, choose the problems we have and maybe also the, the possibility to get rid of them through life experiences. That is one perspective. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't agree or disagree with it. I, I see that as a perspective. Okay. What what I find strange is when I go to Hawaii and I see the overwhelming green. That's what yes. reminds me. The sea, of course. There's, there's always sounds. Uh, there is the Pele. There is the, the volcano. There's always this feeling that the the, the island might. You know, it's a, it's like a living entity. Uh, how come that the invisible plays such a, an important role uh, role then in the in the? It plays such an important role in Kauai by changing people just from being there. When people come to Kauai, generally they have a profound experience of relaxation, of uh, relative peace, uh, and a restoration of more of who they are, who they were before they went to their job and their career and their marriage and their mortgage and all the stresses of, of life. Um, that energy of Kauai seems to uh, 
make it easier for us to get in, in contact with that's that good. part of us that we really like, the yeah. part of us that we like to think that's, this is who I am. I agree. I've been there and I had that feeling this is very special. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's the end of the world in, in one way and then there's this green island. On the other way, uh, hand, you might say, well, there's just, just a lot of oxygen in the air there which gives you a boost, yes. so you feel better. Yes, well, I mean, it, it's, that's, that's a perspective as well. <laughs> that's a perspective as well, to, yes. to look at these things, that there are, yeah. maybe the water is purer and the air is clearer than in most places. So you Negative feel. ions, all those things, yes. There's, there's, many, there's many ways one could rationalize why these good feelings occur, mm -hmm. and I think they're all valid. They're all valid, but yes. there, then there is the Huna ID that... So, is, do you believe that the island is an, is, a, is an entity? Yes, I do. It's my experience that that's true. Uh, it's, uh, I've it does, does it go for the big things like the volcano and the island, or does it go to the, to the level of the flowers themselves that might have gin energy? It, I, it goes to the level of the flowers, and it goes to the big things. We, uh, Kauai is five million years old. Its, la it, its volcanic action is long over. Many feel that Kauai is the northernmost part of what is still surviving of the continent of Lemuria, which many believe sunk 25 to 35,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, of which the Lemurian animals on some islands are seemingly a remnant. I think they're, they're one of these islands out there. Uh, you said five million years old. In yeah. fact, it means five million years young because yes. in geological terms, Hawaii is very young compared to yes. what we're sitting here. Well, the Hawaiian islands are very young. There's, they're still being created today. Kauai is the oldest of the Hawaiian islands. And then a new island pops up every few million years or a few hundred yes. thousand in, years. In fact, they're creating, the one's being created right now to the uh, east of the big island of, Kauai, of Hawaii. Is that... A concern in daily life there that there might be uh, earthquakes or volcanic outbursts? Well, not on Kauai. There's no more volcanic action. There's no more earthquakes. But on the big island of Hawaii, it, it, it's happening all the time. Mm -hmm. Health and Hawaii, how does that relate? I mean, have Hawaiians been uh, healthy people in the past? They have been healthy people in the past. They're relatively unha unhealthy people. As far as Americans are concerned, statistically, they're in, the w in one of the worst categories of their health. And, and why? They, they eat too much, they drink too much, they smoke too much, they don't move too much. The, the missionaries that came there uh, hundreds of years ago brought a system of uh, religious belief to them and yeah. that, that put them in a subclass that they they were considered to be heathens uh, their system of religion and philosophy was considered to be meaningless uh, they were sinning all the time running around in in uh, bare feet and the missionaries brought little things to plant in the ground to make them have to wear shoes and etc cetera, etc cetera. and their lifestyle was so significantly altered and they've been so subrogated that um, they have they have had a hard time surviving in any capacity. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are great exceptions and wonderful, strong, wise, marvelous Hawaiian people that exist today, but generally that's not the case. Yeah, yeah when I go there, and I mean, there's a lot of Hawaiian culture on, on, on the big island and on, on the, uh, everywhere you go, you, you see dancing and stuff like that, but it, is all, it all feels very touristy, very, yes. uh, you know, it, this is a business. Yes. Uh, but there, but there is something at the basis of that, too, because hula, which is what you see, uh, was the way that the Hawaiians uh, passed down their lineage and all their important information through the, the dances and the meles, that they call it, the songs that go behind the dances. And that was all before things were written down. And then, as in many cultures, once you start yeah. writing it down, you lose the essence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had an oral tradition that in, involved the dancing. And I've seen that, and it's you know you see the mountains and, and you, know, you yes. see the sea flowing, and there's this whole uh, right. yeah the, the whole movement thing that yes. that uh, yeah when you see little kids do it, it becomes you can see it's part of an educational uh, tradition. Um, but then there were also sicknesses. I know uh, around um, Kauai there were there were or some other islands there were places where you had uh, lepra. Uh, leprosy? Leprosy. Yes, that was on, it was on all of the islands, actually, yes. 
and they actually had colonies where people were... Yes, there was one island where they were brought and, and cordoned off, yes. Yeah. Isn't there a small island near Kauai that uh, is privately owned? Yes, it's called Nihihau. It's owned by a private family, and only, Hawaii, I mean, only um, full-blooded Hawaiians live there. Uh, it's, it's debatable whether this is a good or a bad thing. Some believe that it's a good thing because it's preserving the Hawaiian culture without much contact with Westerners. Others think it's, it's a form of servitude to yeah. the uh, Caucasian individual who owns the island. <laughs> yeah, a yeah, little kingdom that's, that's yes. out there. Say, coming back to uh, the, the specifics of your work, huh? you, you give workshops and, 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 and trainings, but now your flower essences, in which way do they differ from, say, the standard buck? remedies that you can get? Well, Bach has 38 flower remedies, and Bach looked at the flower remedies as if they uh, took apart a person's psyche, which was all based on emotional conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the flower essences that I have, in, I have ma made approximately 100 of them in Kauai, and basically they, compared to Bach and compared to other flower essence systems around the world, they deal more with... Um, Love, the heart chakra, compassion, uh, spirit, power in that way than many of the other essences. Uh, as the Bach system and my system uh, overlap in many ways, but the Kauai flower essences seem to work on, on more of a higher consciousness. I mean, and, and basically individuals who enjoy them, in my experience, are using them uh, to deal with their evolution in consciousness. Okay. The feeling I get now is that back remedies are remedies for certain ailments, certain problems you have. Yes. Uh, you, Psychological, sick. emotional uh, problems. Yes. yes, and you say mine are more evolving uh, substances. I believe that's true, yeah. yes. That from experience, so, that's what I see. So even if you feel good, you can use them. <laughs> If you feel good, you can use them. I use them every day. I, I've used them every day for, for maybe 20 years I've been using essences. And I think it's the use of, of I, use, I use essences from all over the world. I think flower essences are an incredible healing modality. I'm obviously, because I do this, I'm particularly open to them and receptive to them. But I think they've played a great part in my personal evolution. And I don't think I'd be where I am without them. Okay. Uh, before you did this, you were a lawyer. I was a lawyer, I was an environmental lawyer for 25 years and basically representing the quote-unquote victim against the chemical companies and, and the U.S. government in many cases. Okay, but from law to flowers is a little bit different, yeah? It's, it's a, thank God, it's, it's what saved me. But I, I went from an environmental advocate to an environmental midwife. And so I'm still working for and with the environment, but I'm not working in any adversarial system or any in any adversarial nature anymore oh, well, it's interesting you do workshops on healing now apart from your remedies what and from your essences what um what, what does that contain well healing is a is a big subject and as i've watched my own healing i've i've learned a little bit i'm, I'm just a simple guy but i have really one of the greatest lives of anybody on the planet uh, i'm very grateful and i really would like to explain to people a little bit how that happened and how it could happen for them. Part of what I do is wrapped up with the Hawaiian system, the Huna system. Part of it is the observance of breath. Um, our breath is a trigger for our consciousness. Our breath is a method for us to um, trap our traumatic, stressful events in our life and, and bury them. Is, uh, is breath the prime mover? Is it the prime factor in, in who we are? Breath is such a major factor. <clears throat> I test people doing energetic readings to s see what flower essences are appropriate for them. When I do that, I, I have acquired the ability to tap into another person's energy field where I can feel their energy. Um, it's, I'm sure it's something anyone can do, but I put a lot of attention to it and it's easy to do it. I can, there's many people when I'm testing them, I, I feel they're a dead, just a dead person. And I say to them, could you breathe for me? And they breathe a little bit and I say, could you take a little deeper breath? Mm -hmm. it's, and then I, 
they all of a sudden yeah. come alive. But the question is specific, not is it a major factor, because we all can agree on that. Is it the most important factor in what shapes our personality and our life? It could be. It, it, it may be. I haven't tapped it to that level, but there are many examples which would say yes. Yeah. But I don't look at it as the most important factor, but it's a factor that can turn us on like that. Well, if you take our, our thoughts, yeah. the, the main factor in, in a psychological and a body makeup, or is it our heartbeat? Or is it our breath? And I tend to say it's our breath because I've seen that if you want to change people, uh, and it, changing the breath is really the only way that works. And you can do that by putting them in a monastery and make them sing every day. You can also put them in a harness. And uh, I've met people who had serious accidents whereby they were part of their breath, breath apparatus had to got damaged. And they changed their personality. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced that breath is extremely important and really the only way if you want on a long run to change people you have to sit them down and make them sit in a specific position thereby changing their whole energy uh, but maybe uh, as you say there's no proof uh, well whether there's proof or not we definitely both agree that it's a very powerful vehicle to open uh, open us up and I also agree that if you don't change your breathing pattern it's difficult to maintain what you might experience on a one-shot basis and you really do need to shift your breathing. It, one Hawaiian word, haole, is that it's a word today used to describe Caucasians. It was the word that the Hawaiians used to describe the missionaries who came to save them. And what it means is shallow breather. And what the Hawaiians observed from the Caucasian Westerners who came to save them was that these people were shallow breathers who had no mana, no chi, no flow of energy. They had all the right words and philosophies and systems, according to them, uh, but they had no uh, example to the eye of the Hawaiian that this person actually has power. This person actually is embodying so, uh, okay. someone with are, power. Are you talking about something that, that some people would call aura, that you can see even not really seeing but feeling the energy of a person? Yeah, well, the aura is an extension of that power. The more that power is activated, the, the more your aura is activated. You, we all have auras in any case, and uh, I can see auras if I desire to see auras. And from my observation, uh, say with breath, the more you breathe, if you breathe rhythmically and circularly uh, and vigorously, your aura will definitely expand. Mm -hmm. Deep breathing. Um, there's some... Vedic theory that says that your life is decided by the number of breaths that is allocated to you. So if you want to live long, you have to breathe very deep and very quiet, you know? Yes. Other people say it's the number of heartbeats that you have, but the, yes. the heart is also a machine, but it seems that the breath is there, uh, the depending factor. How can we learn to change that? I mean, I can tell you, man, you need to change your breath. Uh, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how? First, you have to experience that you, something can happen because without the desire, nothing's going to change. Uh, I could give you today the magic pill, and if you didn't have the desire for something to happen, the magic pill is not going to do it. Uh, same with the breath. You know, it, it, no, we're not going to do anything unless we are open to and desirous of doing it. I have made uh, various... You can, you can bring the horse to the water, but you can make it drink. Yes, and so what, what, I've, what I do in, in my workshops and when I work with people on breath is I've made CDs that ha have beautiful music and I have various visualizations and guided techniques through it, but the whole background of it is to provide a really beautiful experience, one someone really enjoys, and then to let them s test what, what's the fruit of this. Is, is this significant to me? And, and the experiences that I have when people br breathe in, in these ways, it, it's absolutely amazing what, what people, what they experience, what they contact, the information they bring back. I mean, one thing that happens when people... Yeah, but you're now talking about a specific session yes. whereby you, you, you uh, guide people to do circular breathing. Uh, yes. There's many uh, uh, systems in the world that use that. Yes. Um, through that process, you might go back to your traumatic experiences that are related to the breath. For instance, your birth. Yes. Uh, the famous theory that, that the, the three phases of the birth are represented in our, in our psychological makeup. Um, 
okay, so you experience that. But then when you come out of it, how do I change my normal, regular, daily being into being more relaxed in a way and breathing more deeply? Or is that a result of, of getting rid of the, of the traumatic imprint? Well, it's everything that you just said and everything that I've said. And the biggest word that I will use again is desire. If you don't desire that to happen, it's really not going to happen. If you do have a flavor of it and, and it seems right, and then you say, yes, I really desire this change. I would like more of this. Then there, there are many tools that can be used. Um, breath is one of them. Flower essence is, an, is another one of them. And through the use of these tools, there are many possible changes that, that, are, that are easily accomplished. But if someone really doesn't have that flavor, that this is what I'd like, because we're so conditioned, we're so deeply, deeply conditioned that we don't realize that we're really a robotic culture that is satisfied with living lives of servitude. Okay, well, uh, people like Good Jeff has, have been saying that, but if you go all to the, the, the FedEx stories and uh, many... Uh, mystics have told us this many people have said okay uh, come back to yourself feel the mana feel the chi energy uh, of course the, the, the chinese and the, the, the asians they have tai chi where they they, they exercise in, yes. in some ways and I've, I've always find that when you're in china in the morning you open the window you see the people doing that they start a day with feeling their own energy yes uh, which is extremely important yet why has modern medical technology not tapped into this i mean you're still seen as a as an alternative healer and it's nice and, and flower essences and there's people that use them but when i go to a, a normal hospital at the door it doesn't say when you step in here you know start breathing or something like that yes why has because allopathic the, medicine not picked up on this because allopathic medicine dis treats disease allopathic medicine does not work, some do, but generally does not work to promote wellness. And they're two different concepts. Uh, I do not desire to be sick, and I rarely ever get sick. Uh, and I pray that that continues. But uh, I, I'm, I'm focused on wellness. Breath is part of that. I would say that most of the people, if you did some kind of study, and this is all speculative, but once they're in that hospital setting, you could look and say, yeah, most of these people are relatively howly, shallow, shallow breathers. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, I always like the Chinese system where the doctor gets paid when you're, when you're well. I like when that you get system sick, too. you stop paying. Yeah, yeah, yes. because that changes the whole... Now you go to a hospital and I had a feeling there's some accountant who says, ah, there's a guy, he needs so many hours of this and that treatment and that. Yes. Ah, that you walk in as a, as a sum of money. I sometimes have that with the, with the, when I go to the dentist. The guy looks at my mouth and he says, "Well, this is my new Volvo." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have, the, the basis of the system leads to a, a, well, I wouldn't say abuse, but the wrong direction. It, it does. And another, I mentioned before that that first principle: the world is what you think it is. If I'm a doctor it, and I see someone come in, I am basically looking for his disease. And then generally they find it. There's, with, the, with the modern ability to, to go through the body on every level, You'll there's never always, <laughs> yeah, there, there's never a disappointment. Yeah. So uh, that, that's, that's part of the problem as well. I, I think that, uh, you know, when I use that ro word robotic, I don't try to mean it to be demeaning. I mean it in a sense as a, a smelling salts that, uh, you know, let's wake up. Let's, let's see what the alternative is to this whole repetition of society for thousands and thousands of years running the same theme mm -hmm. and which is not personal power which is not uh, personal compassion i mean we, the examples that were given are our saints and messiahs jesus buddha muhammad etc cetera, etc cetera. but this is all just basically it, it's all meant for each of us to have, and, and, and basically, unfortunately, it's... Uh -huh. But why is it uh, the, this, this whole trend of, of alternative medicine, the, the, from uh, Ayurvedic to acupuncture, whatever, came up in the 60s in the West, we kind of opened our eyes to different ways of treating to different uh, systems of, of health. Um, it had its heydays. Uh, in the 90s, there was a small surge, but now it feels like materialism, materialism in the Western world has taken over and we are more concerned 
about our option plans and what the NASDAQ does than about our health. Um, yes, we subscribe to the green to the green world and, and uh, health food stores are very popular in the States, but I don't feel that the deeper meaning that you're trying to convey here, that there is an that there is a spiritual essence in the world that we have to sp spiritual energy. Um, it seems fading. We we seem to become more mammon oriented more and more. Well, I don't think it's necessarily fading. I think actually I I would take the opposite view. I think that it's actually it, it is rising. I think it's rising um, with a larger base this time. And I think that science is finally catching up with it. And science and quantum physics are uh, giving people the confirmation that they wanted in the 60s that, yes, this is, there, this is in bona fide factual thing. This is, something's happening here. There's a, shi there's a shift. We can measure it. We can see it. Uh, we can photograph it in ways we didn't used to be able to. Now we see the aura, we see the shifts, we see the energy patterns. And it isn't just uh, voodoo, accepting that somebody is, is possibly has something and, and it's all speculation. I think that's what's shifting, is that science is catching up with what was there in the 60s. It's still there, and I believe, personally, there's going to be an enormous resurgence. Well, uh, being a physicist, I, in, in, in a way, uh, I have to agree because uh, we now have uh, come to the point where we see that observer and observed yes. are part of the experience. In other words, the reality as we see it, and if, whether it's a scientist looking at a tiny, tiny little uh, mini part of our universe or we looking around, that, that what we see is part of what of the seer. Absolutely. Yeah? And science has given that in, 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 in all kind of theorems. And then we have even come to the point that there is a connection between every point in the universe at the same time. It's called the non-locality uh, uh, theorem of Bell. Um, that everything is connected, even faster than the speed of light, so that you are connected. And a famous story about the butterfly on Hawaii <laughs> is quite appropriate here, that everything is connected to everything else. Science tells us that. Yes. But yet the world as a large, and we're just in, the, in this period, we have uh, President uh, Bush here in Europe talking about the uh, Kyoto, uh, uh, what was it, uh, preservation of, uh, what was it, anti-ozone or something? Oh, it's about uh, car Car emissions. Uh, yeah. Car emissions and stuff yeah. like that. The United States has said no to this Kyoto agreement. Yes. I find that depressing. Well, m the majority of the people in the United, the United States find that depressing. The majority of people in the United States find President Bush depressing. Uh, unfortunately, he's characterized a schism that exists in the consciousness of the United States right now that is obvious to the whole world that 50% of the United States people are good Bubba, W kind of people, and 50% uh, of them are a little bit more liberal, a little bit more intellectually active, uh, looking forward, and uh, one 50% is, is ruling. So it's, it's, the United States is not, a, is not a, a happy little melting pot at this point. Uh, it's a divided society on those issues, materialism and... and uh, well, the... Bush's, Bush's presidency has shown a, a division which has never been shown before. In one sense, the, the, the people that voted for Bush are supposed to be, go to church more often than the people who voted yeah. against him. Yeah. Uh, but yet, what we see in reality is that probably the more religious, spiritually active people are in the second category, the ones that voted for yeah. Gore. Well, so I don't know. I, I more have a feeling that uh, you, can, you can divide it in the Dionysian and the Apollon, Apollon uh, approach. One, if you have the patriarchal God, the one who's above us, and it seems that the fundamental uh, people that are partly following Bush are more of those kind of believers, and the other, the Dionysian ones, who says the spirit is in everything. Yes. And it's more we can experience it now, the exper experiential uh, feeling, are more in, the, say, in the Gore camp. I, I personally didn't like Gore that much, but that other camp of yes. people. Um, but we get the feeling that the world is moving towards that Bush model of uh, do as you're being told and economy reigns uh, supreme over health, uh, 
yes. the things that you describe as, as experiencing at Kauai. Yes, well, that's the case. That's unfortunately the case. And and I, I like to look at things optimistically, and I and I optimistically look at that, that, that once people all over the world uh, get a better picture of what it is that this old paradigm that Bush represents, what it is that that actually uh, sp spells out in their lives and in policy, uh, I think that uh, we might get we, we might start moving forward again. I, I think that we probably needed this look back to see that, well, no, maybe the answer is not by going back into the tried and true uh, systems of the past, and maybe we do need to get out of the box. Yeah. Going back to where we started, talking about Hawaii, would yeah. you say that as Hawaii went to a shift, as you say, from a metrical system and then got to Tahitian, which was more of a war system, a patriarch, yeah. the man ruling it, that you can see in your society what that patriarchal system has done to the people. Yes, definitely. I see it all over the world. I see it here. I see it every place that I go. This world is a patriarchal system. It's based on war. It's based on machismo. It's based on I'm stronger than me. Uh, you know, don't, don't say anything to me or I'll knock your block off. It, it is an us and them system. It's an us and adversary. The, the whole world is, is structured adversarially. And not, and not as a... And not as a connection is well. Yeah. See, part of my my philosophy is that the, is that everything does support us, that everything is supporting us. And the unfortunate sense in that is that if I'm correct and everything is supporting us, but yet uh, 90 percent of the people are perceiving it as I have to look out, I have to defend myself. Then what a sad <laughs> thing it actually is when we've been presented this gift and and what a lovely life option we're presented with. But yet we look at that gift and we and we define it as ah, I guess I got to protect myself. Maybe this guy is uh, giving me some shabai here that I have to. Uh, and, and, and that's the that's the sad part, I believe. Okay, Ken. One last question. Your website is Star Men, not Star Month. Star Men has been an A with Star Men uh, dot com. Yes. Yes. Now, is there a relation to the guys out there or what? <laughs> Uh, there's a relation to the, to the guys out there. It's a, it's a big relation, you know. I, I think we're all star men. I think that this is this. We're is all definitely star dust. Star dust, star men, star women. Yeah. Uh, this there's is no difference in in the material uh, substance between us and out there, Jupiter, or far, far out in the in, in the galaxy. Again, science has showed us that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we're just star stuff. Yeah. We're just the stuff of clouds, stuff of cl stuff of stars. And stars, stars are the creators, are the givers of energy. Planets are the suckers. Planets require stars to survive. It's another little metaphor. We're all star men. We're not the ones that are just victims surviving on sucking other people's energy, but we really are independent, powerful beings, like the stars. Okay, thank you. Nou, we hebben gesproken met Ken Carlson en u kunt zijn website vinden op www.starman, dus s t a r m e ncom Hij geeft cursussen, u kunt u ook op die website vinden, Hij, uh, u kunt uh, zijn producten, dat zijn flower essences, dat zijn dus, uh, ja, het zijn geen bloemen uh, parfums, maar het is de essentie van de bloemen opgevangen en uh, dat kun je gebruiken om uh, ja, je beter te voelen. Uh, ook bepaalde klachten te, te bewerken. Maar hij legt de nadruk op het feit dat je dat moet gebruiken... om een stapje verder te komen in het bewustzijn. Je als het ware meer te openen voor uh, de wereld om je heen. Om, en een andere ding wat hij doet uh, in dat kader is uh, ademhalingstechnieken. Hij geeft workshops in ademhaling. En hij zegt, ja, ademhaling is ongelooflijk belangrijk. Als je daarmee begint, en daar kun je heel veel dingen mee doen... dan kun je teruggaan naar je traumatische ervaringen, zelfs je geboorte. Je kunt door ademhalingsoefeningen je heel veel uh, beter gaan voelen. Maar vooral... Bereiken dat je meer, je meer openzet voor de wereld om je heen. Want, zegt hij, dat is een steunende factor. De wereld is er voor ons en als steun om ons te doen groeien. De wereld is geen vijand en als we de wereld als een vijand gaan zien... dan krijg je een heel verwrongen leven waar je, je altijd maar moet verdedigen. Het is beter om te verwelkomen wat er is. En uh, wat dat betreft toch vandaag weer een beetje inzicht in de magie van het leven in een gesprek met Ken Carlson. Nog een keer www.starman.com. Thank you for being here. Thank you.